Welcome back and congratulations. You're getting near the end here. We're getting to the end of the boot camp series of videos that Paul and I have created. And once again, Paul has asked me to do this one on my own solo. So my apologies, you don't get to hear Paul's wonderful voice today. Uh, but I realized after doing the best in class ETFs that doing these solo gives me an opportunity to go rogue on Paul a little bit. So at the end of this presentation, I think I'm going to be able to do something that I don't normally get to do, and that will be fun. Today, we're going to talk about two funds for life. And I am really excited about this one because in a lot of respects, I think it is a nice grand finale. It's a nice way to finish out the boot camp series. If you think about it, up until this point, Paul has been encouraging you to be a do-it-yourself investor using a la carte mutual funds or ETFs, low-cost ETFs, obviously, that provide a a broadly diversified portfolio across geographies and asset classes, and then fine tune that with a bond allocation that meets your risk tolerance. And that risk tolerance is going to change over time. So he's also asking, we are asking that you would adjust that as you go along. And we're asking that you would annually rebalance as you go along. Some of you may be intimidated by this. If you really think about it, it's it's a fair amount to do. I mean, it's not overly onerous. It's stuff that you have to do on an annual basis, but it's a manual process. Uh, it means that you have to pick your portfolio, the one that you like best, that you know, based on all of the information that Paul's provided. You have to commit to that portfolio and annually rebalance it in accumulation. You have to figure out as part of that portfolio selection, what your risk tolerance and capacity is and adjust your bond allocation appropriately. You have to periodically look at that risk tolerance and adjust it as you get older because it's going to change with age probably. Uh, and then when you get to your withdrawal phase, you need to decide whether you're going to use a fixed or flexible withdrawal strategy and what percentage to take and then live with that through retirement as you continue to do the uh, annual rebalancing. So it can sound like a lot. And the thought that came to mind as I was preparing for this presentation is that uh, what you'd really like maybe as an alternative is automation. And I like analogies. So I was thinking, well, what's an analogous thing that has become automated in our lifetimes? And a a good example of something that's become automated in our lifetimes, at least for, for me and for many of our listeners, I know many of you are also early retirees or nearing retirement, is the automatic transmission on cars. For those of you who lived through the gas crisis back in the 70s, you remember probably that automatic transmissions were a bit evil because they weren't that gas efficient and people would seek out manual transmissions because they were more fuel efficient and they were going to save money in an economy where it was really hard to buy cheap gas. You, you couldn't do it. And today you'd be hard pressed to find many manual transmission cars in the United States. So what happened? What happened between then and now? Well, it really is a story of efficiency. Between then and now, we went from a situation where the automatic transmission was 10 to 20% less efficient at gas mileage than the manual transmission to the situation we're in today, where the automatic transmission on cars is actually more efficient. Unless you're the perfect driver, it's very unlikely you're going to beat an automatic transmission in fuel efficiency when it's got eight speeds in the transmission and it's got uh, overdrive where it, it locks out the, the torque converter. And, you know, it's just, it's really designed to shift the gears at the right moments in the right time to give you fuel efficiency. Well, in personal finance, there's been a lot of automation that's happened over the same period of time. We've gone from where you had to buy individual stocks to where you could buy mutual funds, where those mutual funds became ETFs. Uh, where both of those became cheaper and lower cost. And now we have 
an innovation that many of you will know about, some of you won't, called target date funds. And what target date funds do is give us the ability to buy one fund that is locked to the year that we think we're going to retire or something close to it. And then they automatically adjust the, the volatility of the portfolio based on this expectation that you're going to want it to decline as you approach retirement and then uh, get better, even you know, decline more as you go into retirement. And to give you an idea of what a target date fund looks like, let me, uh, let me share something here. This is a slide that shows the Vanguard Target Retirement Funds. That's the name they use for their target date funds. And what it shows is the glide path or how the asset allocation changes over time. For those of you on the podcast, don't worry. I'll talk about enough of it that you'll get it. Uh, you'll notice, though, on the chart, for those of you who can see it, that it's all locked to this idea of retirement around age 65. But you can think of that as just retirement. Um, it, because if you're going to retire at 50, you would put your retirement year into the selection tool and you would pick the year. You don't actually pick your age, you pick the year. So if you were going to retire in 2065, you would pick the 2065 target retirement fund. If you were going to retire in 2050, you'd pick the 2050 fund. And what that fund does is it starts out with a very high equity allocation, as we would hope. Um, it's 90%, not 100%, which would be ideal. And then around age 40 or 25 years prior to retirement, it starts to ramp that down. And by the time you're at age 65 or right around retirement, you're in a 50-50 allocation. So you're 50% US uh, or 50% stocks and 50% bonds. And then it continues to ramp that down going into retirement so that by the time you're at age 72 or seven years after retirement, you're down to about a 65-35% allocation where 65% is in bonds and 35% is in equities. So why does it do this? Well, you can imagine as you're approaching retirement that you would want to have less uncertainty about the size of your nest egg so that you know how much you're going to be able to take out in retirement. Well, this does that. Your volatility is going to decline as you get closer to retirement. You would also imagine that as you get into retirement and you have fewer years to live, because you're getting older. That's one of the sad truths for those of us in retirement is that the older you are, the fewer years you have to live, um, that you would want to have your assets in something that is more certain and less volatile. And so that's basically what the target date fund does. And it's a very powerful tool. It's so powerful that in the United States, it's the default for many new employees when they sign up with their employer and they get news about their 401k at the end of their first year of employment, they may be told that they're defaulted into a target retirement fund, a target date fund like one of these. And in fact, a very, very high percentage of US retirement fund savings in 401ks and other type retirement accounts is invested solely in a target date fund. So it's very popular, it's ubiquitous, and it's automatic. And for Vanguard, it only costs you 0.08% per year. So it's incredibly cheap. So like the automatic transmission, we've gone from a world where to have these services, to have this available to you, you had to pay 1% per year management fees to where you can get it for 0.08%. So those of you who've been following Paul's work have noticed two things that maybe aren't ideal about this. The first is that it has bonds in the early years. And the second is that this portfolio of stocks in the United States and international doesn't include any tilt to small or to value. It does include small stocks and it does include value stocks, but not enough to matter. The small is offset by the large and the value is offset by the the growth. So the only way you get the benefits Paul has been advocating, these meaningful diversification benefits, is to have a disproportionate amount in those. So does the target date fund do what it says it does? 
Well, in the same way that Paul has been back testing all of these allocations, all of these portfolios in his previous presentations, we can back test these allocations at the different time horizons for the target date fund. So if we look in five-year increments, starting at 25 years or more before retirement, then look at 20, 15, 10, 5, 0, and 7 years into retirement, what do we see? So if we look 25 years before retirement, historically, going back to the 1970s, same dates Paul's been using, the target date fund allocation you have as a young person has delivered a 9.8% compound annual growth rate. Very respectable. By the time you're 20 years prior to retirement, that drops to 9.6. So just a little bit of a drop, not much. By the time you're 15 years before retirement, 9.4. By the time you're 10 years before retirement, 9.2. Five years before retirement, it's 9.0. Zero years before retirement, right at retirement, it's 8.7%. And seven years into retirement, that asset allocation over the last 54 years has delivered 8.0%. So you see that the target date fund is lowering your expected return for the money you have invested as you age. But why is it doing that? It's doing that because it's significantly reducing the volatility at the same time it does it. So if you look at the worst case drawdowns for a young person, it's 48% over that same period of time. If you look at the worst case drawdowns for the retiree who's seven years into retirement, it's 17%. Dramatic improvement. So it's doing what it says in a sense in that it's lowering your volatility as you get older, but it's also doing something that I don't like quite as much, and that's that it's reducing your safe withdrawal rate late in the uh, the uh, glide path. So the safe withdrawal rate and these numbers, the safe withdrawal rates are going back to 1928. At 25 years before retirement, if you use that allocation, which is an almost all stock allocation in retirement, the safe withdrawal rate for that portfolio is 4.2% or has been, I should say. The portfolio that they used seven years into retirement only had a safe withdrawal rate of 3.5% because it's very heavy in bonds. And so on the one hand, yes, it's doing what it's supposed to do. On the other hand, I think it's introducing some risk that is unnecessary. And as we already pointed out, it doesn't have these tilts to small in value that provides some meaningful diversifications. So how can we bring the meaningful diversification that comes from tilting towards small and tilting towards value back to an investor who's using a target day fund? Well, the obvious solution is to add a second fund that is invested in small cap value. Now, for our modeling purposes, we're just going to use a U.S. small cap value fund. But if somebody wanted to maintain their international diversification, they could use a combination of a U.S. small cap value fund and an international small cap value fund. But just to keep things simple, we're going to just use a U.S. small cap value fund. And what we'd really like to have so that we can see what happens when you add a little bit, say 10 percent or 20 percent or 30 percent, is something like a fine tuning table. Paul has already shown you several fine tuning tables. And what we've done is created a two fund for life fine tuning table. And we've included it in the portfolio configurator. So let's go there now and take a look and see what happens when instead of investing 100% of your retirement savings in a target date fund, you invest, say, 90% of that savings in the target date fund and 10% in small cap value, or 80% and 20%, or all the way up to 50% in the target date fund and 50% in small cap value. And I think what you'll see is that there is a powerful lever here, something that can help a lot. Here is Paul's website, paulmerriman.com. And if you go under portfolios and scroll down, you get to portfolio configurator. And if you select the portfolio configurator, 
We showed this in the best in class ETF selection video, and we spent some time on this part of it, the sound investing fixed allocation portfolio configurator. But if you look on the left hand side, we also have two funds for life and a two funds for life fine tuning table. So let's spend just a little bit of time on the two funds for life fine tuning table and discuss what it does for somebody who's interested in automating their retirement planning and using a simpler portfolio. Across the top, what you see is the time until retirement. So you've got 25 years or more, 20 years or more, 15, 10, 5, 0, and minus 7 or 7 years into retirement. And below that, it gives you for today the approximate name of a fund or the year of a fund that would fit that category. So you've got the 2050 target date fund, 2045, 2040, 2035, 2030, 2025, 2015. And just under that, you see what the allocation is for a target date fund. This is based on the Vanguard like glide path. And you can see how the equity allocation declines and the bond allocation increases as you go across that chart. And then on the left-hand side of the chart, we have different two fund for life allocations. So we've got a 100% target date fund, a 90-10, where 90% is in the target date fund, 10% in small cap value, 80-20, 70, 30, 60, 40, and all the way down to 50, 50. And at the very bottom, just for reference, there's the 100% US small cap value. And for each of these boxes that exist at the intersection between the years to retirement and the portfolio allocation that you've chosen for two funds for life, we have the nominal CAGR going back to 1970, the worst 10-year CAGR going back to 1970, the annualized standard deviation of the compound annual growth rate, and that's a measure of volatility or how much it fluctuates, the worst drawdown experienced going back to 1980, or I'm sorry, 1970, and then the 30-year safe withdrawal rate based on analysis going back to 1928 so that we get some of the big dips in the 60s. And the way this is going to work for somebody who invests in the target date fund for their retirement horizon and then never does anything about it is that they are going to ride across this chart left to right. So when they are 25 years or more before retirement, they're going to be in a portfolio that has historically delivered a 9.8% compound annual growth rate with 13.4% volatility and a 40, 48% worst case drawdown. And five years later, with no change on their part, their portfolio is going to change because of the allocation change within the target date fund to deliver a little bit lower return and a little bit lower volatility and a little bit better worst case drawdown. And it's going to, by the time they're 15 years before retirement, they'll be to a 9.4% CAGR with 40% worst case, draw, case drawdown. And by the time they're at retirement, they'll be in a portfolio that historically had an 8.7% compound annual growth rate and a 25% worst case drawdown. And this will just automatically happen for them. Now, if they wanted to, they could, and people do, invest in a target date fund that's not about the year they're going to retire. In an extreme case, they could look at this and say, I'm a nervous Nelly. I don't want to experience a really bad drawdown. So even as a young person, I know I'm giving up return. I'm going to invest in the 2025 target date fund. And if you said you were going to do that, then instead of getting a 9.8% expected compound rate of return, you'd have an 8.7% compound rate of return historically. But instead of a 48% worst case drawdown, you'd have a 25% worst case drawdown. So how would you stay in that portfolio? Well, you'd have to change every five years. So you'd invest in the 
2025 portfolio today and five years from now you'd invest in the 2030 portfolio and five years from then you'd invest in the 2035. So you would have to change it occasionally, but you could stay in one box. Now, most people won't do that, but but it just explains how the chart works, I think. And you can see on this chart, if we look at just the young person's choice and we go down the column, for somebody who's 25 years or more before retirement, if they're 100% in the target date fund, their expected return was 9.8%. If they shift 10% towards small cap value, it goes up by about half a percent, 10.3%. If they go to 20% in small cap value, it goes up to 10.8%. If you go 30%, it goes up to 11.2%. If you go all the way to 50%, the historical rate of return was 12.1% compared to where we started in the target date fund at 9.8%. So you can decide. You can decide how much you want to tilt to small in value. You can decide how much you want to do that versus time. Now, for somebody who invests in a 50-50 split, you can march right across that chart if you want and watch how it evolves with time as well. Um, now, there are some people in our audience, quite a few of you, I know, who are retirees who aren't looking at the left-hand column. You're not thinking you have 40 years to go. You've got maybe 20 or 30 years and you're not accumulating. You want to manage risk in retirement. Well, for you, I would look over at the columns on the right-hand side. And I would probably focus not just on the compound annual rate of return and the drawdowns, but I would also look a lot at the safe withdrawal rates. So let's look at the allocation of a target date fund that's seven years into retirement. That means it's never really going to change its allocation anymore. It's reached its final allocation. So that might be like a 2015 target date funder. I think if you go to try and buy a 2015, you won't be able to. What you'll find is that Vanguard has converted the 2015 into a target income fund now. Uh, and that fund will stay the same throughout your retirement. So you could invest all of your money in retirement in Vanguard's recommended allocation, if you will, for a retiree who's well into retirement, and you would have an expected return of 8% and a worst case drawdown of 17% going back to 1970 and a safe withdrawal rate of 3.5%. But if you believe in Paul's work and you believe in the work of the academics that drove it of Nobel Prize winners, and you want to tilt to small in value, you can look down this chart and say, well, how would that help me out? or how would it have at least, if you added 10% to that allocation, it would have bumped your expected return from 8% to 8.7%. So more than a half a percent. If you added 20%, it would bump it to 9.4%. If you went all the way to 50%, it bumps it to more than the S&P 500 at 11.4%. The part that I find most shocking is that as you are increasing this risk and taking more drawdown risk, and let's look at that for a second, you go from that 17% for the all target date fund to it's practically the same, 17% because of rounding with the 90-10, 22% worst case drawdown for the 80-20, 27% for the 70-30, and 39% for the 50-50. So you are taking more risk, but look at what happens to safe withdrawal rates. The safe withdrawal rates actually get better. So you go from 3.5% safe withdrawal rate for an all target date fund well into retirement to the 50-50 having a 4.7% safe withdrawal rate. Now, why, why is that? How could that be? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, you're putting more of your money at risk and at work by investing a higher percentage in equities, which have a higher expected return. And second of all, you're investing in more meaningful diversification because you're taking some money and you're putting it into small and value, which tend to move at different times. They don't move in sync with the total market. 
And those two things together make for a more resilient portfolio. And I think that argues very strongly for somebody who's in retirement to consider using a two funds for life approach. Now, some people will say, well, wait a minute, I had a two funds for life approach way back when Paul introduced the S&P 500 plus small cap value. And that's true. You could combine that with bonds and get to pretty close to the same place. Some people will also say this is inferior to the ultimate buy and hold because the ultimate buy and hold is more broadly diversified. It's got 10 funds. I get REITs and emerging markets. Well, that is that is true. And I think the biggest benefit of the ultimate buy and hold is control. Uh, when you look at these approaches compared to the ultimate buy and hold, you don't have control over REITs. You don't have control over the amount, that, as much control at least, over the amount that you have in US and inter international. You can't independently control the amount that you have in small, the amount that you have in value, the amount that you have in growth, the amount that you have in blend. So I, I will readily acknowledge that. Some of you won't have access to a low cost target date fund. If you don't have access to a low cost target date fund, I would seriously consider not using a target date fund because your expenses are going to matter a lot. Um, some of you are going to uh, look at this and say, I don't mind doing all of the manual stuff on my own. And that's fine too. For those of you, though, who are really attracted by Paul's idea or, or his allocations that we've talked about previously that are half in small, half in large, uh, half in blend, half in value, there's another way to look at this chart. And that's to look at where the equivalents are for that kind of an ultimate buy and hold allocation. And these bottom left two boxes, something between 40 and 50% allocation in the early years, about a 45% allocation to US small cap value mixed with a target date fund gives you a half and half. The same thing is true uh, when you're 20 years before retirement. Uh, by the time you're 15 years before retirement, this 40% allocation to the small cap value gives you that kind of a half and half mix. Um, it kind of dr continues to drift up. And by the time you're actually in retirement, something between a 20 and 30% allocation or a 25% allocation to small cap value gives you that half and half mix. So if you want to achieve that sort of thing, you can still do it and your expected returns would be about the same. So you don't have to be complex to get great results. There is one last drawback to the two fund for life approach that I want to highlight, and that's that you don't have as much control over asset location. So when you're using these funds that are combined, like a target date fund that puts the fixed income and a lot of your equities together, you can't, for example, control where the bonds are and make sure that they're in the tax deferred account and make sure that some of your low yield equities are in a taxable account and some of them are in the tax deferred account. Uh, you just don't have that control. But if they're all in a tax deferred account, it's nothing to worry about. And the fact that your small cap value may or may not be in a taxable account, I think over the long run is not that big a difference. Uh, ideally, if your small cap value generates a high amount of yield, you'd like that in a tax deferred account. So if you can get it in a Roth or in a in a, an IRA or a 401k, that would be better. But uh, it's just one of those things to know. You don't have as much control about asset location. Also, if you want to learn a lot more, uh, the owner's manual for this strategy is my book, Two Funds for Life. And it goes into a huge amount of depth on different approaches you might take that we haven't spent time on today. And I think it answers a lot of questions that come up along the way. And that's why I wrote the book was to, to really help you live with it if you choose one of these strategies and to live with it throughout time. So, you know, we're, we're reaching the end here of your boot camp and I realized when I did the last video that not having Paul here gives me an opportunity to 
do something that he has done to me many times over the years. He has embarrassed me with praise I didn't feel like I deserved too many times to mention. And I wanted to pause and first of all, thank Paul for creating this foundation and for being so generous to give his time, record podcasts from the hospital, for gosh sakes, uh, to, um, to put his whole heart and soul into it as well. Those of you who have had the chance to talk to Paul on the phone, and I know there's many of you, will know that he's incredibly generous with his time and incredibly generous with his heart in terms of really only caring about trying to make a positive difference. And what struck me as I got ready for this podcast, and I was thinking about Two Funds for Life in particular, is that we spend a lot of time talking about how to make more money, how, how to invest for good returns. And yet here is the founder of this foundation who made an absolutely awful investment by taking a sizable amount of his net worth and putting it into something he will never get a dime back from. Probably the worst investment in financial terms he's ever made. Uh, and he continues to make that kind of a mistake, if you will. So why? You know, why did he do that? The reason is obvious. Uh, it's obvious to anybody who's listened to him. Uh, it's obvious to those of us who've lived long enough to experience the investments that come outside of personal finance. Uh, there's a lot more to the world than money. Uh, he invests that money in this organization because he knows that the best returns in life often come from helping other people, from investing in relationships, in, in trying to basically be a good person. And I thank Paul from that for that. Uh, he's blessed my life, and I think he's blessed many of your lives by that dedication and that example. His example is louder than his words. That example, I think, is important to remember at the end of this series of videos on the boot camp. It's important to invest so that we can become self-sufficient, so that we're not a burden to others. It's important to invest Ideally, so we get more than enough because that doesn't just lead to a life of luxury. It leads to a life that lets you bless the lives of others by serving them too. It lets you not just not be a burden. It lets you also be a help. And I think that's where Paul's example is so powerful because it shows that there are these really, really high returns that come from things outside of personal finance. They come from trying to make a difference trying to be relevant in the world and caring about the people around us. And I thank Paul for that. And I thank you for listening. I thank you for uh, sticking with us through these boot camp videos. And I look forward to joining you again sometime soon, hopefully in a Q&A with Daryl and Paul. And I wish you the best of luck. Thanks a lot.